Great. Uh, thank you for coming again tonight. Uh, this, is, this is class number 10, as it turns out. This is the halfway point uh, for the course. Uh, this is the second uh, discussion that we're going to have of the Karen Silkwood case. That We've uh, divided the Silkwood case, as you've seen from the reading assignments, into a, into a, uh, a longer period. There's four, four different uh, uh, classroom discussions of the, of the Silkwood case. Uh, Sarah discussed uh, last Tuesday with you uh, the part one, which has to do with the original national news stories that came out about Silkwood, uh, the New York Times, Ms. Magazine, Rolling Stone, National Public Radio, et cetera, and the organizing that went on, the uh, gathering the, the national support for pressing for uh, congressional hearings, et cetera. Uh, we're, the, the presentation is going to be divided into four parts. That's the beginning part with the organizing in public education, grassroots organizing, fundraising, those kind of things. Uh, part two, which we're going to be doing today, is on the investigation uh, itself. Uh, part three, which will be Tuesday, uh, the 8th of May, is, is going to be about the trial itself. Details about the trial over and above that which you've already read about. Uh, and then on Thursday will be the discussion of the appellate process at the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, the United States Supreme Court, all these weird things that were going on back and forth. How did the, how did the amounts of money keep changing? How did all that happen? Uh, we'll deal with that on Thursday and talk about uh, a bit about Three Mile Island that followed up right after this case. Uh, so today is the discussion of the investigation. It will include the discovery process even though that's technically part of the trial process, it's, it's really more correctly part of the investigative process. Uh, and there, there was a time when the discovery process in a federal civil case uh, was a very major part of the discovery, of, which is what it's called, uh, of the actual evidence to support one's charges. But with the new reactionary uh, predominance in the federal court system, in their hostility, toward uh, lawsuits against major corporations, their hostility toward public interest lawsuits of any kind. Uh, the, uh, a significant uh, plurality of the federal judges now, 83% uh, of whom have all been appointed by Richard Nixon or Gerald Ford or Papa Bush or Bush Jr. or Reagan, uh, are, are very hostile toward the discovery process. Uh, and as you may have noted in the, in the reading that you did, uh, the first two federal judges that we got on the Karen Silkwood case, uh, uh, Luther Eubanks and Luther Bohannon, uh, both were being extremely uh, unsupportive of our attempt to secure discovery from Kerr McGee, uh, the depositions, et cetera. They were, uh, they were constantly considering things to be not relevant. They were constantly allowing the... Uh, uh, the defendants to refuse to answer questions and depositions and refusing to rule on motions to compel, et cetera. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, Judge Frank Tice uh, got appointed by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals that the case began to move. And we'll discuss a bit of that uh, today in the context of the investigative process of discovery. Uh, so the uh, as, as I said, the Sarah had talked about uh, the organizing and public education aspects of this and, and getting the case going, and the reality is that without Sarah and Kitty Tucker and Bob Alvarez, very importantly, from the Environmental Policy Center in Washington, D.C., this case never would have happened at all. Uh, and the, if, this case, if this case had not happened, uh, we would probably have over 250 private nuclear power plants operating in the United States right now, as distinct from the 103 that there are. Uh, and with that many nuclear power stations operating, with the kind of massive weather events that we've had, uh, with you know hundreds of tornadoes at a given time coming down in Alabama or in Tennessee or in the Midwest, and with massive flooding in uh, New Orleans and other places in Vermont, you know, that by this time we may well have had uh, a major nuclear disaster uh, here, uh, analogous to the one that happened in Japan, uh, if it had not been for Sarah and Kitty Tucker and Bob Alvarez and a group of the other people that, that Sarah talked with you about last week. Uh, and, very importantly, uh, the, the whole Three Mile Island event 
uh, would have been covered up. You know, while, while there was an initial alert about Three Mile Island, if we had not come into the case at Three Mile Island and forced the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to stop uh, in reverse its original order in which it authorized the Three Mile Island nuclear, nuclear facility to, to pump all the radioactive waste materials out of the damaged uh, core into the Susquehanna River. If we hadn't been there to stop them, that would have happened. And then they would have all just concealed what had happened there. So that there's, a, there's a great debt of gratitude that is owed to that group of people with Sarah and Kitty and Bob and a number of the other people that they were talking about, uh, that Sarah was talking about on Tuesday. Today, we turn to the investigation of this. And uh, as, as uh, uh, you know, the, the, the teaching assistants had assigned uh, Richard Rashke's book, The Killing of Karen Silkwood, uh, for you to read, uh, a fairly major undertaking. There's also the, uh, the movie that, uh, that you've had an opportunity to get to see by now. Uh, and then there was a third book called Who Killed Karen Silkwood that was written by uh, Howard Cohn who was the Washington bureau chief for Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, on the cover of it, there was a photograph of a big uh, uh, graffiti that was on the wall in the Lincoln Tunnel in New York City saying, who killed Karen Silkwood? I mean, literally, we had nothing to do with that getting written up there. Uh, I happened to be coming into New York City one time in a, in a taxi cab, and I saw it there, and we told Howard Cohn about it. They took the photograph of it, and it's on the cover of his book. Uh, and but the well, that, the book that you read, the the Rashke book, you know, tells about ninety percent uh, of the story. Uh, but the fact is, Richard Rashke wasn't really there uh, during the investigation and during the trial and other times, and so he wasn't really on the ground. So he, a, he missed a lot of the really most dramatic moments that took place during the course of the investigation and during the course of the trial. Uh, because if you're not there, you don't, you, you, just reading through the transcript, you can't really tell sometimes what, what really was going on in the courtroom. Uh, uh, but uh, secondly, he left out uh, entirely uh, a whole bunch of really major things that happened during the course of the investigation, uh, some key elements. And, and very importantly, thirdly, he actually got confused uh, about some of the chronologies that, uh, in, in which things happened in uh, some of the investigative facts and some of the even legal findings there. Now, all of that's innocent enough because uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Dick was trying very hard uh, uh, to be impartial, uh, a little too hard, I think, probably trying to be impartial. So he, he didn't actually interview us as much as he might have uh, and didn't ask us some of the uh, more challenging questions that would have clarified some of these things where he went off center a little bit. Uh, and he didn't allow us to look at the, the galleys to, to correct anything that was wrong before it got sent to the printer. And because of that, uh, he had a number of, of errors uh, that were in the book. And what I've done is in trying to figure out, you know, I read through the book, I, was, I hadn't read the book actually before. <laughs> for having to teach this class. Uh, it's been around for a while, but I never did read it. I said, what difference does it make? You know, we know what happened in the case, but uh, when, I, when I was going through the thing, I discovered some of these spots where uh, he had left something out. You know, I'd get to the chronology and him telling the story. I said, oh, wait a second, what happened to such and such there? So I made some notes to, to kind of organize what I'm gonna say to you today. Uh, and so, uh, so I'll review some of those uh, to help kind of choreograph what I'm going to be saying to you, some of those spots that were left out. This is all assuming, of course, that you've read and completely committed to memory uh, all the rest of the stuff that were in the 400 pages uh, so that uh, it'll fit in. Now, now, starting out sort of at the beginning of this, uh, the, uh, he says, uh, he says uh, on page 388, sort of at the, it, toward the conclusion of the book, he asserts, kind of, I was kind of surprised by this, he said, Bill Silkwood, uh, that's the father of Karen Silkwood, the head of the Karen Silkwood uh, estate. Oh, you haven't read? Okay, well, here's a, here's a, okay, you haven't read the whole thing. All right, here. Then, uh, well, I hadn't either, so don't worry about it. Uh, that uh, he, he, say, he says, he says on page 388, he said, Bill Silkwood had gone to court to prove that Kerr McGee was grossly negligent and that this gross negligence had led directly to the contamination of his daughter. And then he said, but he had approved of 
the conspiracy investigation, hoping that it would answer the question that wouldn't go away, who killed his daughter? Okay. Now, the, the way that makes this sound is that, that Bill Silkwood had gone to, gone to trial to really try to prove that the nuclear power industry was really a bad industry. And oh, by the way, he also happened to kind of tolerate the investigation to find out who killed his daughter. Uh, the fact is it was completely the other way around, that what, they, what they, the family really wanted to find out who killed their daughter. Uh, and in the process, they were perfectly willing to allow us to investigate and show how bad the industry was because that's what she was working at at the time that she was killed. Uh, and, uh, and, and secondly, uh, a second matter I saw that, that, uh, that uh, at page 320, uh, Dick was talking about why Judge Tice had dismissed uh, the count two, the major civil rights count. He argued that uh, Jackie Saruji, the woman who was the reporter from the Nashville Banner, uh, and, and then from the, uh, from the, the Tennessee, uh, what was it, uh, Ziegenthaler's Nashville, the Tennessean, the Tennessean, that uh, she somehow was claiming these national security objections and privileges and didn't have to testify about things, and that Tice had gone into a, an in-camera uh, process of listening to what the, the evidence was and then came out and, and dismissed the count against us. Well, that's just not true. That's not how that happened. And what I want to do is I want to tell you, uh, for example, how, how this thing goes. Uh, he said, he said, uh, he said, the case, this is on page 387, the case was over. Kerr McGee remained legally innocent of all negligence charges and the Supreme Court declined to review Judge Tice's decision on the alleged conspiracy to deprive Karen Silkwood of her civil rights. The Supreme Court let stand uh, Tice's ruling that the Civil Rights Act of 1871 was aimed at protecting only the rights of blacks and other racial minorities and not those of a white member of a labor union. Okay, now that's just completely incorrect. Now, if, if you hadn't gotten to that point so you weren't confused by that, uh, you may be now confused uh, that I've raised it for you. But the, the bottom line is, here, here's, here's what happened with regard to the, this whole count too. The, the, the bottom line is, is that this, we conducted the case in two parts, as you could tell. We conducted it, it, it one, one is basically a murder investigation to find out who had killed Karen Silkwood. Uh, and, and then secondly, we conducted it as a major campaign to figure out how to close down the construction of new nuclear power plants in the United States, how to do both of those things. And when we, when we, began, when we began the murder investigation, uh, which was count two, it's important to understand in count two, what we had claimed was that uh, there had been a federal criminal conspiracy in violation of Title 18 of the United States uh, Criminal Code, Section 241, a federal criminal conspiracy to deprive Karen Silkwood of her rights that it included not just the right to organize a labor union, which would be under the First Amendment right of freedom of association, but also the right to freedom of the press, because she was killed while on her way to meet with David Burnham of the New York Times to turn over documents to him directly. He was sitting there waiting in the Holiday Inn for her to deliver these documents. And so it also interfered with her right of freedom of speech, of being able to, uh, that she was being punished to keep her from speaking out about what was going on at the plant. But very importantly, she also was, uh, had, had her rights violated to travel safely on the highway. The federal criminal conspiracy statute uh, prohibits interfering with anyone on the public highways because of your disagreement with their attempt to exercise constitutionally guaranteed rights. It's a very specific provision of the Federal Civil Rights Act. And because she was on the public highways when she was rammed and run off the road and killed, that, those, that statute covered this. It also covered her Fourth Amendment rights because she had, she had had her phones wiretapped and her home was bugged. And of course, people had gone into her home, we alleged, and intentionally contaminated her by putting radioactive uh, plutonium on the food in her refrigerator. Uh, so that violated her Fourth Amendment rights of privacy. So all of those, all of those accusations were part of the charge uh, against them in this, in this count too. Uh, what, what had happened is that this is, the, this is the one that was driving the case. This is the one that was terrifying the Kerr-McGee uh, Corporation because if we could prove that 
she had been killed by them to silence her, then you could have gotten huge, massive punitive damages. Not just the punitive damages for allowing the radioactive material to escape the plant and contaminate her at her home, but for actually killing her. Those are the maximum kind of punitive damages that you could really get. And so that this is what we were, were attempting to do. Uh, and so he, he, he states, he states that, uh, that when I found out from uh, Peter Stockton, uh, then I don't know, did, did you guys read about the fact that Peter Stockton had been chasing Jackie Saruji around and trying to get her to reveal to him which documents she had gotten from Kermagee or other things? Do you remember that in the, in the reading parts? Okay, well then I'll tell you about that. Okay, that, uh, what, what, here, here's what happened. I'll, I'll just start from the beginning. It's going to be easier this way. Okay, that, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the story. Here, here's how, that, so I'm, I'm, out at, I'm out at Wounded Knee, right? That I'm legal counsel for the Native American Rights uh, Committee for ACLU National. Uh, we were doing the Wounded Knee trials out there, the big major, major leadership cases. I'm sitting at the house of Herman Thunderhawk, uh, who is one of the AIM organizers, and uh, we're having a meeting. Uh, there with Russell Means and some of the other people. And uh, we, because I'm a news addict, I, I, I get up from the meeting and I go and I turn on this little television, this little black and white television, and there's ABC uh, Evening News. Actually, it's the Reasoner Report. And, uh, and here is uh, David Schumacher uh, from ABC News telling, he's standing on a, next to Highway 74 in Oklahoma uh, with the wind blowing on him and he's giving this report about this young woman who's been killed. Her, her car's been found uh, destroyed along the side of the road, and she's, uh, dis she's, her documents have all disappeared, and there's this big mystery around this. So I turn, I turn to Russell, and I say, oh, wow, shit. Boy, is somebody in big trouble on this one, man. I mean, look at that. Somebody's really stepped in it here. Uh, they've killed this, this woman. Uh, and somebody's really going to get them for that. Uh, and so, so that was that was like that was November fifteenth or so of 1974, right? And I'd, I'd gone out there. Uh, I was back at Divinity School, and I'd come out to to start to prepare for one of the trials. And so I go back. I go back to Divinity School, and long story short, I'd ended up got I'd been recruited uh, out of the Harvard Divinity School uh, to go to become chief counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters in Washington D.C. at their National Social Ministry Office, right? And so one of the cases that I was doing there is I was defending the Berrigans. Uh, we'd actually set this one up. I can't, I can't help tell you this little story. That, uh, that when Gerald Ford, when Richard Nixon had been impeached, the articles of impeachment had been passed by the House, and he resigned, uh, then, uh, then Ford was, came in as vice president. And remember, Ford pardoned Nixon. And what he did is to try to cover for himself, having pardoned Nixon, he turned around and said, okay, I'm going to also issue an amnesty or a pardon, a blanket pardon for any of the young men who refused to respond to the draft notice uh, or who evaded the draft or went to Canada. Uh, let's, let's try to get this whole nightmare behind us. Uh, so they offered uh, amnesty to any, one of the, any American fellow who had refused to respond to the draft. He was going to give them a one-year period. Uh, I was going to give them a one-year period from August uh, of 1974 when he came in to August of 1975. <clears throat> and uh, it, I'd, I'd come to Jesuit headquarters at, uh, in June of 1975. And so we were all, they, they were uh, waiting for the first person to apply. Uh, the whole year had gone by virtually and not a single guy had applied for the amnesty. And they were getting very upset about this. And so, uh, so I was, uh, I, I was uh, contacted by, some, by Dan Ellsberg and, and uh, Phil and uh, Liz McAllister and some of the other people that had been running the draft board raids around the country. Uh, and they were all sort of on the uh, 10 most wanted list for the FBI. And so uh, they, they, they said they wanted, to, they wanted to organize a big demonstration against the Vietnam War. This last one is to show that it was going to come to the end of the period for the for the amnesty, nobody would have applied, and so that we were going to have a big demonstration. So we figured out what we'd do is we'd get a, a young fellow. Uh, we, we got a guy by the name of Brian Barger. Brian Barger was the president of the student body at the University of Maryland, and he had refused the draft. And so we got him organized, and, and I wrote this letter for him. 
saying, hi, my name is Brian Barger, and uh, you know, I refuse to go to the draft. I understand that you have an amnesty program, uh, and uh, I'd like to come in and talk with you about this. And, uh, so he, and so we sent the letter to him and asked for an appointment. The guy jumped, the guy all but came back in person to uh, invite him to come to this meeting because they thought, now we've got at least one person who will have accepted the, the amnesty, right? And he said, so he wrote the letter, and we wrote a letter back and said, uh, and I'd like to bring uh, a few friends with me. And uh, I, I assumed that they assumed that it meant some other guys who may have refused the draft. And so the few friends turned out to be Dan Ellsberg and Liz McAllister and, and Phil Berrigan and uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock and uh, David Abernathy, the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so we, we got a whole bunch of us together, and a bunch of the five, the, the Gold Star Mothers, who are mothers whose sons have been awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. And so we got about maybe 12 of us all together, and we, we went over to the White House, and instead of going in through the line where you've got appointments to meet somebody, we just got in the tourist line. And we went in through the tourist line, and we all come into the White House, and they're showing us the, the blue room and the orange room and whatever they have there. And uh, so, we were, so we were all looking at these things. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the Secret Service guys all started going like, isn't that Father Dan Berrigan? Isn't he on the 10 most wanted list on the FBI? And they said, oh, wait a second, look at there. That's Benjamin Spock. That's Dr. Benjamin Spock, the baby doctor. What's he doing here? So they started talking up their sleeves to each other like this, you know. Rah, rah, rah. And, uh, and so, so, so then they, they, all, they all start surrounding us, right? There's all of a sudden all these kind of Secret Service guys, all, you know, these big six foot eight guys all around us. So then we realized that we'd been made. Uh, and so what the guys did is they all open up their jackets and they pull out these big bed sheets where they've got, you know, down with war and a whole bunch of other things on them. And so, uh, and then they turned around and sat down on the floor in the middle of the White House. And so the White House, they shut down the White House. They ordered all the tourists out and they said, okay, everybody has to leave the White House. Anybody who came in here, even if you had permission, you now have to leave. Uh, and uh, I think I mentioned this to you in passing at the beginning of the course. They, they, the guy came, they, they brought the video cameras in and the, the blowhorns and stuff, and they, the bullhorns, and they said, okay, now uh, you're all going to have to leave. Uh, the, the White House is closed, and uh, if, even if you have permission to come here, if you, fa if you refuse to leave, we're going to charge you with failure to quit. <laughs> That's what he said. And they all looked around and said, failure to quit? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, they said. You know, I want that on my rap sheet, and so they so they started arresting everybody, and uh, so so I get up and I say, you know, okay, look, I'm their lawyer. You know, I've got to I've got to be there to bail them out and to you know defend them and stuff. So I get up and uh, so they get all arrested, and we demand an immediate uh, hearing. You know, we demand an immediate trial, absolute fast trial immediately. And the the local judge in the superior court agreed to give it to him, right? So we get, we get the trial all set up. They have to scramble like mad, the feds, right? And they, so we, start, we pick a jury, and we get the jury in the box. And so we're putting, we're like Dan, Dan Berrigan, Father Dan Berrigan, Jesuit priest. You know, he's been a Jesuit priest for like 30 years by that time. And he's up on the stand, and they're saying to him, we, I, I'm saying to him, can you tell us why you went to the White House? He said, well, actually, we had an invitation. And we showed him the letter. You know, we introduced the letter. Here's the letter inviting us all to come. And here's uh, Brian Barger. You know, he's right here. He's, here's a few friends he brought with him. And, uh, and, his, and, and, and what, did you want to, what did you want to talk with him about? He said, well, he said, you know, I had all this, I've got all this information here. He starts taking out these, these documents to show how that uh, the United States was uh, dropping butterfly bombs in uh, Vietnam where they had these big, huge canisters, these metal canisters, and they had these wings on them. And they were all painted with bright colors that looked like butterflies so that when they would drop them and they would land on the ground in a, and it would set the detonator, and so that little children would become attracted to these and they would go over and pick them up and they were designed specifically to blow off their hands and blind them uh, but not kill them so that the people would have to spend their whole lifetimes you know, taking care of these poor maimed children and stuff like this. And the United States was doing this as a matter of policy and he said, I just found this hard to believe and so I wanted to come and ask the president to confirm it. So, so the jury is going, what? You know, what? You know, what? And, and, and he's going, oh, yes, that's absolutely true. And he starts showing all the documents to the jury. And the U.S. attorney is screaming, like, to stop him from doing this. And so I'm, I'm taking them and handing them out to the jury, and the jury's reading them. <laughs> and so, you know, and then, the, and then the, the Gold Star mothers would come on, and they'd say, hey, why did you come to the White House? Say, you know, I came, my son, my son was awarded the Medal of Honor, uh, and I came to give it back. 
Oh, no, it was horrible. People crying. You know? So anyway, they were all crying and everything. So, so anyway, it took the jury about 23 minutes to acquit them all. Uh, and after, after, the, after the acquittal, we were all jumping up and down celebrating. And Brian Barger comes over to me and he said, this was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my whole life. And I said, well, stick around. There'll be more. Uh, and he said, uh, he said but look, I, I, I've got to tell you something. He said, a friend of mine, Patty Neiman, who works for the National Public Radio. She's the medical reporter for the National Public Radio, if you ever hear her on there. Like Patty Neiman is a friend of mine, and they're looking around to try to find a lawyer for this Karen Silkwood case. I said, Karen Silkwood? Isn't that that woman that was killed out in Oklahoma? Uh, and he said, yes. He said, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to get congressional investigations, they, but they want to have a lawyer. And uh, I thought after all this, that you'd be a good guy to recommend to them. Would you be willing to meet with them? So I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. So I end up getting to meet Patty Neiman, and Patty Neiman tells me all about this, and that there's going to be a meeting over at the Institute for Policy Studies, and uh, they're going to that uh, Sarah Nelson, who is the National Labor Secretary for the National Organization for Women, is going to be delivering this talk about the whole thing, and and all the people that are going to be involved in this ought to go over there, and so I go over there to the, to the Institute for Policy Studies, and and uh, in comes Sarah, sweeping in with documents falling out of her arms and she's got 300 suitcases of her documents and she, she comes in and starts telling us all about the case and, uh, and so I said uh, I'm in I'll do that that's a good idea so we started looking at all this stuff so I go I start going to meetings with Sarah and Kitty Tucker and Bob Alvarez and uh, start figuring out what's going on and I said well look at this is basically a murder case and so what I've got to do is I've got to go get Bill Taylor uh, and Bill Taylor is the guy who'd been assigned to me to be my private investigator when I was the, one of the lawyers at F. Lee Bailey's office. And we had both left Bailey when we ran into this Kennedy assassination stuff and decided that we didn't want to be there anymore. So we left. I went to Divinity School. Bill Taylor went back down to Florida. And so I decided I'm going to go down to find Bill Taylor uh, and get him to help investigate this. And so I fly down to, down to, down to Miami. And it turns out he is uh, captaining a big 72-foot yacht uh, called the My Sin, uh, owned by a, uh, a, a uh, criminal, actually. He was a professional <laughs> criminal uh, who had been defended by Lee Bailey. He was a mobster from down in Miami. And he had this big, gigantic yacht, and he'd been sent to jail for some time. And so uh, Bill Taylor had been left to be in charge of his yacht. Uh, and uh, Bailey had asked him to do that as a favor for him uh, and attend to his 23-year-old girlfriend, this guy, uh, and to take, make sure that she stayed out of trouble. And uh, so he was there. And so, so I, go down, I go down to, and we're sitting in the My Sin, this big 72-foot yacht. We're sitting in there talking about the Karen Silkwood case. And, uh, and so I said, look, we need to find out what happened to her, just what, what in the world happened to her. So he gets, he gets, he gets out of the yacht, and he walks up onto the wharf, and he goes to this payphone and he starts dialing a number, and he starts talking to a guy he calls Alpha. And he starts talking to this guy, and he, he wants him to check in on the, the Silkwood case to find out what in the world's happened here. And uh, this, guy, this guy tells him, he says, look, this is very serious. This is a very serious case. They're really terrified about this thing. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, documents on this thing. There's June mail in the, in the June mail room, uh, which is the code word for black bag operations where they, where they burglarize houses and take documents and stuff. That They've got the June mail on her and everything. And, uh, and so he said that he's, he's open to, to working on this with us. And so we started talking with Sarah and, uh, and the other folks. We organized a, a 501c3 operation called Supporters of Silkwood. Uh, it didn't have its own C3 yet, so we organized it under the Quixote Center that had a 501c3, another a Catholic action group. And we began doing the investigation. Uh, and and uh, I went over to see Peter Stockton. Peter Stockton was the uh, congressional investigator working for John Dingell. John Dingell, who now chairs the, the, uh, the uh, House Commerce Committee, which is one of the all-time powerful committees in the Congress. He, at the time, uh, he's a, a congressman, Democratic congressman from Detroit. He was chairing the subcommittee of the Commerce Committee, the subcommittee on energy and the environment. And so it was the perfect place, and Sarah and the people had figured out where to go to try to get the investigation done. And so I knew that Peter Stockton was there. So I go over to sit down with Peter Stockton, 
and started pressing on Stockton to tell me what was going on because uh, uh, the, we were getting, they were getting set to have one of the hearings. He started telling me, so look, he couldn't talk to me right now about this because there was going to be a person who was going to be appearing as a witness in the first one of the hearings, but I should just come to the hearing and watch what was going to happen, and then I could talk with him later. So we went to the, I went to the first hearing. Uh, I don't know whether Sarah told you about the hearing because I didn't listen to the whole thing, but anyway, up shows Jackie Saruji. Jackie Saruji shows up. She's a reporter for the Nashville Tennessean. She says that she's writing a book called Critical Mass about nuclear power, uh, pro-nuclear power, and that she was going to write a chapter about Silkwood. Uh, and in that context, uh, she had uh, come into possession of a lot of documents and stuff about Silkwood. Uh, and she ended up being put on the stand and put on the spot about wh how she got these documents, what was she doing with the documents, how did she get these, etc. So I went and saw uh, Peter afterwards, uh, and he told me that uh, she had come to him uh, and uh, come into his office and sat down and told him that he should stop this investigation about Karen Silkwood, that it was going to prove to be very embarrassing to the Congress uh, if they tried to go down this line about this poor martyr woman and blah, blah. And, and, uh, and Peter said, well, why? why? Why should we stop this? She said, well, uh, she uh, smoked marijuana. And Stockton goes, yes. <laughs> and she said, uh, and, and not only that, but she went to bed with three different men all in one year. I thought he must have made a mistake. She, met, she went to bed with three men at the same time for a full year, you know. But, but no, it was, it was the other way. And so, uh, and so he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't adequately shocked by this. And so she got all distressed, and, and, she said, and he said to her, I said, well, look, at where, where, where did you learn this anyway? And she said, oh, it's right in the transcripts of her telephone conversations. And so he freaks out, he said, and, uh, and realized that uh, he gave me the hint that it looks like uh, Silkwood was being wiretapped. And so I had a start. I had a lead on this thing. So I said, great, okay, now we, we've got an idea that she's being wiretapped. So what I do is I, I, I fly down to, back down to Miami and go see Billy Taylor on the My Sin. And uh, we sit down and I tell him, I said, look, it, we got information that she's being wiretapped. Uh, let's find out uh, who's doing the wiretapping and surveillance and stuff against uh, the anti-nuke people. If we can do that, we can maybe get a lead on this thing. And this is how, this is how you do it, right? And so, so Billy goes back out, uh, walks down the old wharf and gets on the payphone again and calls Alpha. And uh, uh, he gets in and, and Alpha, he says, okay, uh, I need to know, he said, who, who's doing the Ill illegal surveillance on the uh, anti-nuke people? And he says, uh, the Alpha says to him, Go to Georgia. And Billy says, go to Georgia where? He says, that's all I can tell you. Just go to Georgia. And so he comes back. <laughs> but we go back onto the boat. We say, Georgia, Georgia. So we have to get in the car and go to the store searching around to get a map of Georgia. So we go, didn't have internet and stuff that day. And so, so you go running around. We went to one drugstore after another trying to find a map of Georgia. So we finally find a map of Georgia, right? We come back down to the map room, and we're, we're, in, the my, we're in the My Sin, right? This big 72-foot yacht, yacht. And we go down into the map room, and we spread out this big map of Georgia, and we start looking around at the map. Just, you know, oh, are you finding anything? No, I'm not finding anything. Are you finding anything? We're looking all over. Finally, he comes upon, it turns out there's a big double barrel nuclear power plant, uh, Georgia Power, uh, down in, down in uh, uh, Savannah River. And so he says, there's one right there. And so we looked all over, so that must be it. That must be what they're talking about. So let's figure out what we do about this. So I, we come back and I say to Sarah, I fly back and I say, we've got to be able to hire Billy Taylor. And what we have to do is we have to hire him at professional rates so that he can maintain, to, for all of his sources, when he's trying to talk to them, you know, he's a licensed professional investigator. He's being paid professionally. This isn't a crusade. This is just a job. I've got a professional job. Uh, would you help me out? You're an old buddy of mine. Would you help me out? And so uh, we had to raise the first $10,000. We had to give him $10,000 ahead of time uh, to work. And so Sarah ended up going around talking to people, and we ended up, uh, I, I think it was uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Barbara Marks Hubbard of the Marks Toy Company, uh, Fortune, uh, ends up giving us our first $10,000 donation. And so we write a check for $10,000, and, uh, and uh, I, I bring it down to Billy Taylor, 
And Billy Taylor ends up, he, he flies up to, uh, up to Georgia and uh, goes to Savannah River and rents an old renter wreck. And he drives over and he goes and finds uh, uh, Eddie, uh, what was his name? Uh, Eddie Garland, Eddie, uh, attorney, Eddie Garland, Edward Garland Jr. And we knew his dad, Ed Garland, who was a big, famous trial lawyer down around Atlanta. This was his kid who was a lawyer. His dad had died, so, so Bill says, look, he's, he's the guy I know that does, does criminal defense work and stuff around, around Atlanta, so let's, I'm going to go ask him. So he goes in and he says, look, uh, I need to get some contact inside the Savannah River nuclear plant. Do you know anybody at all that is connected to it? And Eddie Garland says, well, actually, uh, actually I do. I represented a woman in a custody case to get custody of her child. Uh, and so, uh, and I, I never did charge her for it. She didn't have much money or anything, so it's, uh, I did a favor for her. So I'll give her a call and uh, see if she can help you. So Eddie Garland calls this lady and uh, sets up a meeting for Billy Taylor to go over and meet with her. He goes over and meets with her at a restaurant, and Billy tells her what it is. He says, what we're trying to figure out, you know, is who's doing, you know, any kind of surveillance uh, on the anti-nuclear people, uh, and uh, do you have, could, could I, is there any way I can get a, a, a list of people that work at your plant? Maybe there's somebody that I would recognize, you know, one of these scumbags that I know that, you know, who do this kind of criminal wiretapping and all this other kind of stuff. And so she says, well, actually, I've got a number of these old printouts of the entire payroll uh, list of everybody at the plant. Uh, and, you know, all we're going to do is throw them away, but I can give you one of those. So she does. She goes to work the next day, and she gets one of those great big things about this thick, you know, those computer with little holes in the side like that, if you guys ever saw those. Anyway, <laughs> anyway they, uh, so, she, so he, he, gets, he gets this great big thing like this, and so she gives it to him. And he goes back to his little, you know, Motel 6. Uh, we're there, you know, you know, like $23 a night of a motel. And, you know, puts the light on and starts going through these things. And he's going through page after page after page. And finally he comes to this name, Bill Levins. And he says, Bill Levins, Bill Levins, Bill Levins. I remember a guy by the name of Bill Levins. It was in, it was in the NAM. He says he was Army uh, see, he was Army Intelligence. Some, he, I always thought he was a dirty sea bag. He said, and uh, I never did like him, but, uh, but I knew some different people that knew him. Uh, I wonder if this is the guy. And so he gets his Social Security number, which is there on the payroll. <laughs> right? It's just right, the number's right next to there, his Social Security number. So he runs, he runs his Social Security number, and sure enough, that's the guy. And so he gets his, got his address right there on the payroll. And so he goes to his house and, uh, and eyeballs him and says, yeah, that's the guy. Follows him around for a whole week. Uh, just follows him at a distance and figures out what his patterns are and what he's doing. And, and there's this bar that he goes to, like every other night or so, he'd stop at this bar. And so Billy ends up going to the bar and uh, sitting there in the bar, you know, ordering ginger ale and waiting for him to come. And uh, he's not, he doesn't come the first night. The second night, and the guy walks. So Billy Taylor gets out, gets out of the booth and he goes over and he goes, Bill? Bill Levins, you son of a bitch. How are you, Bill? And he goes up to him like that, and Levins is going, uh, uh, like this. And so he throws it at him and says, hey, how are you? Do you remember Bill and Fred and Joe and blah? And he's just throwing all these names around, waiting until he hits one, right? And, uh, and Levins goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He says, you know, and he says, he says, you know, and so Bill says, yeah, I remember you. And he goes, okay, yeah, yeah, I guess I remember you. Blah. And he says, come on over here. Come on, come on sit down. Let me buy you a drink. So, so Billy starts buying this guy drinks. One drink after another drink after another drink starts getting this guy slockered. And, uh, and finally, the guy's totally faced. And, uh, and so Billy, Billy says to him, he says, uh, hey, he says, uh, what are you doing anyway? What are you, what, are you, what are you doing professionally now? And the guy says, hey, man, he says, I, I work for the, the Savannah River nuclear power plant, man, and the, in, the, in the security division, man. I work in the security division. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thing called risk management. And Billy goes, risk management? He says, yeah, he says, it's terrific. He said, you know, we got this group of us, and we got our own office there, you know, we got these three cars, you know, three cars, and, you know, you can push a button, and it changes the configuration of the headlights, you know, they roll these different sets of headlights, so when you're following somebody along in the nighttime, it looks like a different car following them. We got, we got uh, you know, infrared, you know, videotape equipment for taking pictures at nighttime and stuff like this. And Billy's going, wow, you know, man, that's really great. So, you know, I'm, I'm in between jobs now. Uh, you know, is there any chance I could possibly get a chance to work for you guys? And he says, yeah, come on, let me show you the place. So the guy, guy goes out and gets in the car, and Billy says, okay, I'll drive. 
I'll drive. So, so they, they, drive, they, drive, they drive over to the plant, right? They drive over to the Savannah River nuclear plant. And so here this guy, Bill Lovins, flashes his big credentials at the guy and through the doors they, they go, and he brings them into their little office, you know, risk management, right? And got, they've got these big univacs. This is way before you know. It's a big, it's a, like this uh, conveyor belt like thing with, with the index cards in it. Uh, and they've got a whole bunch of little index cards, and you push a button, and it goes, and this big old conveyor belt goes around and brings these cards up. And Billy's looking at them, and, you know, they're, and what they're doing is they're, ta they're copying down data on potential enemies of the company. It includes people like the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, anybody who's written a, an editorial against nuclear power, uh, environmentalists, people in the Sierra Club, and what they're doing is they're gathering all kinds of information about them, like who their boyfriends are, or girlfriends are, who they're going to bed with, you know, what their debt structure is, you know, whether they've got a prescription drug uh, uh, prescription at the drugstores. They, they got all this information about them, and Billy's looking at all this stuff and he's going, "Wow, this is pretty amazing stuff you guys got here." And the guy says, "No, wait, take a look at this, man. Let me show you something." <laughs> and he goes, he goes over here and he he, he opens up this door. And, uh, and Billy looks in, and there's like about 100 telephones sitting on the floor, individual phones. And each one of them is hooked up to this little uh, voice-activated Sony tape recorder it's sitting on the floor. And Bill looks at it, and he says, what the hell is that? And the guy says, this is great. He says, this is great. He says, there's a friend of ours, you know, who is now the chief of security for, Pacific, uh, for Southern Bell. And he used to work for FBI, you know, and they screwed him over with all that COINTELPRO stuff, and they forced him into retirement. That's the counterintelligence program, domestic surveillance on people, right? The thing that Saruji was working for, as it turns out. And anyway, he says, uh, he says, oh, yeah, and so he got forced into retirement, but now he's the chief of security for Southern Bell. So all we do, anybody we want to get monitor their telephone calls, we just contact him and say that we have reason to suspect that they're engaged in a potential theft of services from the phone company. And so they put a, a wet tap right on their, right on their line they, at, the, uh, at the pairs, at the plant, right? And then they just pipe it through to us. And so we just record all their phone calls like that. And Billy says, geez, that sounds, that sounds like you could kind of get in trouble for that. And he goes, no, we, we, we give it all to LEIU. Billy goes, great. That's great. He didn't have the slightest idea what LEIU was. Uh, and so he comes out of this meeting, and he calls me. He says, hey, what the hell is LEIU, Billy says. I said, I don't have the slightest idea what LEIU is. So we didn't know what it was. And so, so Billy, anyway, uh, realizes we've got these guys. So Billy goes back to his, his little, you know, little Motel 6, and he looks through, and he sees that there's this little code number right next to Bill Lovin's name, which indicates risk management. That's the division that he works for, right? And so he goes through the list and he looks over, he looks up all the rest of the guys on the, on the payroll that are, are listed under risk management. And so he finds like these 12 guys. And it turns out the head guy for all of them is a guy named Arthur Benson. And Arthur Benson is this total sociopath who was part of the Phoenix program in Southeast Asia, the political assassination program in Southeast Asia. And uh, here he is, the head of this operation, uh, and, there's, and, he, and Billy runs backgrounds on all these guys. And of the 12 guys, it turns out, in this, this guy, Arthur Benson, Arthur Benson used to wear this big skull and crossbones uh, for his belt buckle, big skull and crossbones, and carried this great big silver-plated 357 Magnum in the back of his pants all the time, everywhere he went. And, I mean, these guys are really losers. And, uh, and, and so of these 12 guys that were in risk management, Billy looks up and, like, four of them, all at one time, along with Arthur Benson, worked for the Boynton Beach Police Department down in Florida. And so Billy says, what the hell is this? You know, what, what, what's, why, why would that coincidence be there? And so he calls me up and says, look, I need to go down to the Boynton Beach Police Department to try to figure out what's going on with these guys, right? So Billy goes down to the Boynton Beach Police Department, and he hangs around there trying to figure out what's going on, asking lots of people questions. And, and he's a PI. You know, he's a three-tour three -tour Vietnam Marine Corps veteran, which will get you a long way in the, in the police world, and, uh, and knows everybody. And so he's going around trying to figure out what's going on with the Boynton Beach Police Department. And somebody tells him, say, look, I don't know, but there was this weird group, and this guy Benson was in it, it was some kind of uh, security group inside the police department, some special unit they had. And all I know is that they, they, uh, used, they, had, they got a helicopter paid for by the, uh, by the LEAA, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, under the Nixon administration, paid for a helicopter for these guys. And like every Thursday night, 
after work, they would all go and get in this helicopter, these four guys, and they would fly away. And we wouldn't see them again until like Tuesday morning. And we couldn't figure out where they were going. So Billy calls me up and tells me this, right? So I'm going, wow, what the heck is that all about, right? So I go find Bob Fink. Bob Fink is an old friend of ours. Bob Fink was the chief investigator for Bella Abzug. Uh, see, no lights coming on here. Bella, Bella, Abzug. <laughs> Bella Abzug was one of the great congresswomen of all time. Uh, Bella Abzug was the congresswoman from New York City. And she used to wear these big, gigantic hats about this big. And she was an ardent feminist, you know, I mean, like with an arm on her like a bull. You know, I mean, and, and just would bang on the table and, and yell at these guys in Congress, which they all deserved. And uh, anyway, she was a terrific lady. And, and Bob Fink was her chief investigator. And she had secunded him over to the Pike Committee, which was the House Committee, like the Church Committee, in the Senate side that investigated the, the CIA intelligence abuses after the Kennedy assassination. So Bob was a very sophisticated guy, right? So I go to Bob and I tell him, I say, look, we've got, uh, we've got some information about there's a helicopter uh, that was purchased by the, uh, was sold by the LEAA grant down to the Boynton Beach Police Department from this year to that year. Uh, what I want to find out is where the hell was that plane, where was that helicopter going? You know, and so what he does, Bill or, or Bob Fink goes all the way. He ends up going out to these this warehouse where the where the uh, the uh, the FAA, the uh, the Federal Aviation Agency, the FAA flight plans that are filed on record for all the all the flights that go around the country. He goes out in this old warehouse, digging through all these boxes and finds the flight plans for this helicopter. And it shows that this helicopter was every Thursday that was flying away from the Boynton Beach Police Department and flying over to Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport and was parked there and would park there from Thursday night all the way through the following Monday. And uh, so Billy goes over, goes, drives over to the, to, to, the, uh, to the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport, goes right over to the landing strip where the helicopter had been landing and looks all around. And, looks around, and, there's, and there's this building sitting over there off the side of the, la the landing strip with big, huge uh, razor wire up all around it, no identification of any kind, uh, cameras all around the whole place, no, no, no signs, no windows, no anything. And Billy goes, great. Okay, here we are. Now, now we got something. This is, something's going on here at this place, right? So he, sta he stakes the place out. He gets a little, you know, a cheap uh, motel room and stakes the place out. And, uh, you know, and when he leaves the motel room, he tears off the little corner of a paper matchbook and sticks it in the door for a little marker to make sure no one's in his room, right? He goes over and he stakes the place out and washes this place. Isn't finding much out yet. Goes back the following night, goes back to his, his motel, and he gets to the door, and the towel is gone. And so he, the little marker from, on the door, right? So he, he unlocks the, the door, and he opens up the door like this, and he steps in, and he realizes that there's somebody in the room. All the lights are off, right? And so he reaches out and grabs this guy that's in the room and yanks him over like this, and this other guy jumps on his back, and so Billy has to destroy these two guys, right? So he did, uh, <laughs> and uh, in, in, to a fair thee well, I might add, uh, and ends up uh, then going out downstairs, uh, leaving them both unconscious in the room, and goes downstairs to the lobby and calls the police. And says, I've been attacked in my room. I want the police to come here. And gives them his name. Meet me in the lobby. Right? So he's there. He's waiting half an hour, nothing. He's waiting there for 45 minutes, nothing. So he goes across the road, takes his car, and drives it across the road and stakes out the motel watching what's going on. And about 15 minutes later, this Plymouth comes rolling in, unmarked, comes rolling into the parking lot, goes up the stairs, goes right straight to the room. And he never told him what room he was in at all. And they go in and they haul these guys out of the room. And they bring them down, they put them into the, the, the Plymouth, and then they grab the little scout that they came in and they uh, take off. And Billy co copies down the license plates on both of the, the vehicles, right? Runs the plates. Both of them are not registered anywhere to anybody. Okay? And so, so we were very happy. Now, we realized that we were, we were now hitting into it. Uh, because, and, and it turns out that when, when, he, uh, when he finished trashing the first guy, uh, the, the second guy was screaming and hollering at him in something, and, uh, and he couldn't figure out what the language was. 
Uh, but he goes and calls some of his friends. He starts repeating what some of the words were that he heard. He didn't know what they were. Turns out it's Farsi. They were speaking Farsi. These guys were Iranians. Turns out that they were, that they were a Savak. They were the secret police from, uh, from Iran, for the Shah of Iran. And it turns out that what he'd found, what he'd walked onto, was a place called the National Intelligence Academy. And it was a place where they were training uh, Savak from the Shah of Iran, the Dina from, uh, from Chile, uh, the Bureau of Special Services from South Africa. They were training the death squads. Uh, and the political surveillance people from these fascist countries were training them at this facility and teaching them how to do electronic surveillance, bugging phones and, and, uh, and wiretapping phones and bugging rooms and all that kind of stuff. And that's what he'd walked on to. So he calls me up and he says, uh, he says look, he said, uh, uh, I'd like to have you let me uh, uh, rent a boat, Billy says. And I said, a boat? What do you need a boat for? He says, look, you don't want to know. He said, but I, I, well, can you, will you give me permission to use some of this money to rent a boat? And I said, like, how big a boat? How big a boat, how big a boat do you need? He said, look, just let me rent a boat. And I said, okay, 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 you can, you can rent a boat. So I go, back, I go back to the office, right? And the following morning, I get a call from Tony Mazaki. Tony Mazaki is the, the Washington Reg legislative representative for the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union for Karen Silkwood. Silk has been dead now for a year uh, uh, now, by the year and a half almost by this time, but I'd met Tony Mazaki, and Mazaki calls me on the phone over at the Jesuit headquarters, uh, and he, he says, Danny, I need to have, can you come on over to my office over here by, by the White House? I said, okay. So I drive over, and his, his office is right across, right across Lafayette Park from the White House. So you can sit in his office and look right over at the White House. So he sit, I go over to his office, and uh, Steve Wadka and he are there, and uh, he, we walk out in front of his office and we sit down at this little coffee table. And he reaches in his, his sports jacket pocket and he pulls out an envelope, uh, OCAW envelope, and he pours out onto this coffee table like about eight or ten pieces of this little electronic gizmo thing. Like, you know, it's all in little pieces. And he, he looks at it and he said, what, do you know what this is? And I said, where'd you get that? And he said, well, uh, you know that uh, uh, Sue and I, I've, I've just been elected to be the executive vice president for national organizing for OCAW, and I've got to move from Washington, D.C. to Denver. And so Sue and I were packing up stuff in the house, and I took the clock down off the kitchen wall, and this thing fell right out behind, from behind it, and it fell on the floor and fell all to pieces like that. And, uh, and so I said, uh, I said, well, I said, I got a pretty good idea of what it is. I said, but tell you what, let me take this and, and check it out, and, uh, and I'll let you know right away. So he gives it to me, and we put all the stuff back in the envelope. I put it in my jacket pocket. I go back out, and I get into the old blue flame, which is the little car we had for the, at the Jesuit office, Billy Davis's little blue flame. Remember the blue flame? Uh, anyway, so, we, we, uh, so I drive off to a, to a, a public phone, and I, I call David Waters. David Waters is a guy I knew. He's a guy that works in research and development for electronic uh, technology for the Central Intelligence Agency, right? And uh, it helps to have contacts like this when you're doing an investigation. Uh, so, but, but it's a long story. But anyway, so I, I knew him. And so I, I call him up and I say, David, this is Danny Sheehan. Uh, i got something I'd like to talk with you about. And he said, sure, come on out. And this was Friday, Friday afternoon. So I drive out and, uh, and I drive out to his house out in Virginia and ring the bell, and uh, he comes to the door, and he's got a big chef hat on, and this, big, this great big old uh, barbecue-like bib that he's doing, and he's, uh, so he's, he, he invites me to come in, so we, I go into the house, we sit down, uh, he said, would you like some tea? I said, sure, so he pours me some tea and stuff like this, and he's chitting, chatting, and, and he says, let me, let, me, let me show you something that's really cool, he says, he's, he says you know, I, I got a 14-year-old daughter, you know, so I've, I've tapped all of her phones and stuff so I can listen to her conversations. I don't want to get in trouble. He says, <laughs> and I said, oh, really? Yeah, right? He said, but, but let, let, me, let me show you something. He says, he goes over here and he, he, he goes to the phone and he dials the phone. The phone's dialed back then. He goes in, so he dials, he dials his numbers on the phone and he hangs the phone up like this and then he and I were sitting there and when we were talking to each other, all the, the voice was coming out through loudspeakers in the house. So he, he, he's got the whole house wired, right? And so then we were laughing, ha ha. And so he says, uh, so he says, uh, look, uh, what's, what's this all about? So I, I reach in my pocket and I pull, out, I pull out this envelope and I pour it out on the little tea table there. And I said, do you know what this is? And he looks down there like this and he reaches down and he puts the whole thing back together again in like about 30 seconds. And he holds it up like that and he says, 
what are you doing that the NSA is so interested in? Okay. That's National Security Agency. That's top stuff. You know? And I said, well, I said, let me tell you about this case that we're doing. So I start telling him all this case. And I get all the way down to tell him that we found this place down by Fort Lauderdale, right? In the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport. And, uh, and he's looking at me like really like this. And then I said, uh, yeah. And, I, and he said, so, what, what, uh, so your, your guy hasn't gone in there, has he? He hasn't tried to go in there, has he? I said, no. No, in fact, he was just asking me to get a boat. A boat, he says. <laughs> a boat? What's he want a boat for? And I said, wow. I said, uh, I don't know why he wants a boat. He said, look, 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 look. He says, look, this is really serious. Look. And he gets up and starts walking around like this. And he says, look, uh, look, uh, I got I to gotta call a guy. I got to call a guy. You need to talk to a guy I know. So he goes over and he, he, he dials the phone. He says, hello. He says, is he there? Oh, gee. He said, look, at, uh, look I need to have him call me. Uh, this is David. Uh, have him call me right away as soon as he gets in, okay? And he hangs the phone and he says, look, let me get some more tea. And so he goes over and we're having a little more tea. Phone rings about 10 minutes later and he goes over and he says, yes, uh, this, yes. He says, good luck, look, there's a guy you just got to, you got to talk to. You've got to talk to, okay? And I said, uh, okay, okay. He said, uh, uh, so he comes back over and he sits down and he says, look, uh, it's Friday right now. He said, if you get a call over the weekend, uh, and you're, you're going to be asked to come to a beer and pretzels party, okay? You're going to be the beer, and this guy is the pretzels, <laughs> he says to me. So I said, okay, that's fine with me. So I get up and I leave, right? So I go back home, and we, I'm home Saturday, nothing happens. And Sunday morning, we're just getting back from Mass over at the Franciscan Monastery, right? And I'm coming back over to the Arupe House. We lived in this convent that, right next door to the big national cathedral. So we go, we're coming back home, and here's Father Kozabowski out on the back porch. And, and Wally says, Dan, there's a phone. There's a phone call for you right now. So I said, okay, okay, let me get it. So I go wandering in the house. I pick it up, and he says, hi, Dan. I said, yeah. He says, you want to come to a beer and pretzels party? I said, sure, sure. Uh, he said, same place. So I hang up. So I get in the blue flame, and I drive out, I drive out to, to Virginia. I get to the house, right? And so I'm in the house with David for about three or four minutes, and these two guys come to the door. Okay, come to the door, uh, and uh, one, one guy, maybe about, at that time, he was about maybe 43, 44 years old, you know, big turtleneck, uh, turtleneck sweater, and this other guy, this other guy that's with him, this guy, this no-neck no dude, you know, this big <laughs> knuckle dragger, you know, kind of guy, so he's, he's with him, so they, they, both, they both come in the door, and they, they sit down, and, I, uh, and, and, and David, David says to him, tell, tell him what you're working on. So I start telling him, I blah, 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 and we found this big building, blah, blah, and, and I said, and, they, and he said, yeah, and then, so what's your, what's your guy doing now, they said. I said, well, he wants to have a boat. A boat? <laughs> the guy said, the boat? What's he want, what the hell do you want a boat for, he said. And I said, I don't know why he wants a boat. Look, 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 he says, and they get up, and they all start walking around, gonna, look, look, this is, this is really something, he says, you know, you got, you got to stop him, you got to stop him, he, he, you know, he, he, can't, he can't go there, he can't go there. I said, where? No, 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 we're not able to tell you that, he said. Look, he says, just let me tell you something. He says, look, at, uh, all, all, I got, all I can tell you is, look, I, I've got a, I got a list of security clearances as long as my arm, he says to me. He said, but I can tell you, you're in way over your head. He said, but let me, let me ask you just two questions. You don't have to answer them, but if you answer them, uh, maybe I can help you. He said, number one, uh, have you run into anybody who's got a top secret Q clearance with U.S. naval intelligence? And I said, uh, actually, yes, Jackie Saruji. This reporter lady is in the Naval Reserve and has a top secret Q clearance, Navy clearance. He said, okay. He said, and have you run into anybody that's working for Wackenhut Security? And I said, actually, yes. He had Jim Reading, who uh, is the chief of security for the Kermagee Nuclear Corporation, used to be the head of the Special Intelligence Unit in the Oklahoma City Police Department. And there, in a totally separate building from the rest of the police department, they're in this other office, little office building, and the only other office in the building is Wackenhut Security. And he said, that's it. He said, okay, look. He said, look, there's a guy. There's a guy, another guy that you're going to have to meet. He said, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a call. Uh, I'll call you probably tomorrow. I'll probably give you a call tomorrow, he said, and that I want you to come and meet this guy. So I said, okay, fine. So I'm in the office the next day and waiting and waiting. It's about 11 o'clock in the morning. He calls up on the phone. He calls me and he says, hello, Dan, do you know who this is? I said, yes, I think I do. And he says, look, I can't, we can't make it right today. Can't make it right today. He said, but tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, probably for lunch. 
Okay, uh, but I'm going to try to set this up. Okay, and I, he said, but look, tell your guy, tell your guy he's got to stand down. And I said, look, I, I, I you know, I haven't, I don't have anything from you yet. He said, look, if you don't stand down, I tell you, they will kill him. They'll kill him, and let me tell you, nobody will do anything about it. So I figured we we're in the right territory now, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, so I, we get off. So I go to a safe phone, and I call Billy Taylor. And I said, look, you've got to stand down uh, just for, for a day here. Don't, don't do anything. You know, don't go rent the boat. Hold it a second here. And he kept saying, why, 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 why? And I said, I don't know yet, but just, you know, just trust me on this thing. Just don't go, don't go anywhere right now. So the next day I get the call from the guy who goes, oh, I, I call. I call to uh, David Waters that afternoon. I say, David, <clears throat> you know, I've got, my, I've got my guy stood down here. Uh, I'm on a pay phone talking to him. I said, I got him uh, stood down, <clears throat> but, you know, I'm not getting anything from our friend. And he said, oh, I know. He says, you know, that I, I tried to get him over there too, you know, but, you know, there's some big thing is going on at, at the White House. I just can't get into it. I, he, he just was too busy to talk. And I went, excuse me? <laughs> You know, where was that? You know, I didn't say that to him, but uh, anyway, so this guy's from the White House, right? And so uh, the next day I get the call from, from this guy, Terry, his name is, but I didn't know his name. He says, uh, look, come over to George Washington University to the uh, cafeteria, and I want you to sit down. Uh, just pick a table out in the middle and sit down there, and w I'll meet you there. So I go over to George Washington University, and I go into the lunchroom, and I sit down. I'm sitting there waiting, and so in, in comes this guy, turtleneck, right? And uh, this no-neck dude that's with him, uh, and this other kind of prissy-looking guy, uh, you know, in a suit and tie and nifty-looking guy, uh, kind of a classic staffer, you know, you know, Senator House staffer, it looks like. And he comes, they come in, walk through the little line, they come sit down. So we're sitting there, and uh, they're talking, you know, my aren't the walls straight up and down today, and what do you think of the weather? And, and uh, finally, this big no-neck dude says, you know, you have to be careful, you know, when you're on the telephones, because they might be tapped. You know, your phones might be tapped with what you're doing. I went, oh, really? Thank you. You know, thank you. that was really, this is a very worthwhile meeting that we're having here, you know? And so, you know, we get all the way to the end of the meeting, and they haven't said squat, right? So we get set to get up to leave, and the little staffer guy says, uh, Dan, you said you, said you were uh, going over the hill. Uh, why don't I give you a ride over there? I'm going that way. I hadn't said anything like that, right? So I said, sure, okay, well, I'll do that. So I go out and I get in the car with him and we drive off and we're driving up to the hill. I remember this vividly. We drive up past where the, the United States Supreme Court is. We're right at, we're right at, uh, at uh, Constitution Avenue uh, and, uh, and uh, Maryland, Maryland Avenue, right in front of the Supreme Court. And uh, he said to me, he said, uh, uh, what's, what's this thing with the boat? What is this thing with the boat? Why, why does your guy want to get a boat? And I said, well... I guess he's probably going to have to go out in the water somewhere. Now, that, now that, that didn't seem like a big insight to me at the time. <clears throat> but I said, I assume he's got to go out in the water somewhere. And he, the guy slams on the brakes and, and pulls the car over right next to the Supreme Court building. He said, we've got to get out of the car. We've got to get out of the car. So I said, all right. So I get out of the car. And we're walking down the sidewalk. You know, here's 110 Maryland Avenue right over there. I remember it to this day. Here's the Supreme Court over here. And he says, you can't go there. You can't go there. And I said, why not? He says, you can't go there. He said, an entire ABC News television crew went there, and they were all killed. And no one has ever done a thing about it. So you got to understand, you can't go there. And I said, well, you know, I, they were probably a little more obvious than will be. And he said, no, you, can, you won't be able to get in there at all. He said, they'll kill you. Uh, and then he told me why, which, you know, I, I'm not at liberty to tell you right now. Uh, but, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, it was very, it was very serious. <clears throat> and, uh, and so I said, you know, okay. I said, tell you what, I'll agree to tell my guy not to go, but you're going to have to give us what we're after. And he said, what are you after? I said, we're trying to find the evidence to show that the people that were wiretapping Karen Silkwood, that probably worked in Oklahoma, Either for the either for the uh, the the Kermagee nuclear facility or the police department or the state BCI or someone that was wiretapping her, you know, I assume was trained there at that uh, at that building where they trained the Savak and the other people, uh, in that we're looking we're looking for proof of that. And he said, okay, look, I don't know whether we can get that, but look, you stand him down for one more day, and uh, and you'll get a call. Uh, and then that, you know, they may not agree to talk to you, but they'll probably agree to talk to your guy. 
So I said, all right. So he called me the next day, and, and we flew Billy Taylor back up to Washington. Billy Taylor went and met with this no-neck dude, as it turns out, uh, out at this restaurant out in Virginia. And he tells him that, you know, that uh, in the June mail, in the June mail, which is the, the covert operations black bag uh, data where they burglarize and get data that they have. Anyway, he said that, that, that I've talked to a guy who's seen the Silkwood, the Silkwood uh, documents. There's actually their cards, their, their index cards. He said, and he said that uh, my guy, he said, was, had a right to be in the June mailroom, but you're, you're on camera all the time inside the June mailroom. They're recording everything you're doing. He said, but he happened to be in the S file, and he was going along, and he, he, when he was there, he knew I was trying to find some stuff about Silkwood, and, uh, and he found it. And it, what it says is that, that there was a guy that was in the, uh, in the uh, police department, the Oklahoma City Police Department Intelligence Division, who's gay, it's not exactly the word he used, but anyways, he's, he's gay, and he's having an affair with a uh, a radio disc jockey, working in Oklahoma City at the at the news station there, and they were afraid that uh, he would say something about the Silkwood thing because he was involved in the Silkwood surveillance. And uh, he said, "So I'm, we're telling you that, uh, but you got to agree not to go there, okay? Where your man was going to go." And I said, uh, "I'll." I'll uh, I will try to make a deal there. So, so Billy comes back and tells me that that's what they've got. So we go back, we fly out back to Oklahoma. We go out to Oklahoma and we get, we get a hold of Sherry Ellis. Sherry Ellis is the woman that was played by Cher in the movie. She was uh, Karen Silkwood's roommate. And uh, Sherry Ellis was gay. And so we figured that she knew the gay community. So we give her this information about we're looking for a guy uh, who's in the Oklahoma City Police Department Intelligence Division who just got fired. Well, he got transferred, actually. He got transferred away from the city, and he resigned. And so with that data, you go checking in the gay community and find out who this guy is. So she checks around for a couple days and comes back and tells Billy, yeah, there's a guy named Harold Barons. Harold Barons uh, just, got, just resigned from the, the Oklahoma City Police Department Intelligence Division. He's gay. Uh, and yes, he was having an affair with this radio guy. And so we put the guy under surveillance. Uh, Billy, Billy finds him and puts a tail on him and follows him around for a while. <coughs> follows him, actually, to a Denny's restaurant. Uh, <laughs> it's a funny scene coming up. He, uh, fo he, follows, him, he follows him to the Denny's restaurant, and Billy's, Billy's wired up. Uh, and now, what's his it had it wrong? He had the wrong guy doing the surveillance on him with Dick's book. But, but the bo bottom line is that you know, we put two little mini recorders in Billy's boots, uh, and ran the wires up through his clothes and put these uh, mics under his, under his lapels. And so he goes in, he follows, uh, he follows Harold Barons into the Denny's, and uh, Barons gets up to go to the John, right? And so Billy gets up and follows him, follows him on into the John, and they're standing there at the urinals, like <laughs> standing there at the urinals, and, and Billy look, looks over and says, hey, aren't you Harold Barons? And Barons says, yes, yes, I am. And Bill says, you know, oh, my name's Bill Taylor. Uh, I'm one of the investigators for the Silkwood family. At, at which point, Barron's, in the midst of urinating, uh, turns and starts running down, running, running, <laughs> trying to run out of the bathroom, peeing on the floor, try, trying to get out of there, right? And uh, at, at, which point, at which point, Billy just grabs him by the back and pulls him aside and goes and, and stands in front of the door and holds on to him like this. And, and Barron starts to cry. He goes, oh, he says, look, we, we didn't mean it. We didn't mean it. We didn't mean, it. We didn't mean to kill her at all. We were just trying to stop her. We, had to get, we were just trying to stop the car. We, we had to get the documents. We had to get the, he starts blurting all this stuff out. And it's getting all recorded, right? And so uh, Billy just says, calm down, calm down, calm down. You know, we're just trying to find out. No. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't. Anyway, so he starts telling about what happened. And, and but he just, he said, no, I, I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it after already having said that. Uh, and so we, we get all this, we get all this uh, information. So we, we've now got the information about what's going on, and we know where they're hiding, it turns out. that, that well, anyway, I, was, I was then, shortly after this, I'm teaching a class at George Washington University, and uh, it's a con law class, all right, constitutional law class at the, at the George Washington University Law School. And so I'm asking these kids, the, the kids that are in the class, I said, Does anybody, has anybody here ever heard of a thing called L-E-I-U? And, uh, and this woman, uh, uh, Sheila O'Donnell, 
is in, the, is in the class. She raises her hand. She says, I've heard of that. And I said, what is it? She says, I don't know what it is, but I've heard of it. I said, well, good. Well, why don't you come up after class and tell me what you got on that, right? So she comes up. She tells me the story that a friend of hers is a ACLU cooperating lawyer up in New Hampshire. And uh, when the, when the, uh, the uh, uh, Clamshell Alliance, or was it, the, was it Clamshell up in New Hampshire? Uh, the, or C, C, it was Seabrook. They were, they were protesting the Seabrook facility, the nuclear facility up in New Hampshire, Seabrook. And the Clamshell was organizing against them. And uh, they did a big demonstration. And the police all came in and arrested them. Right, the state police, and they brought him to this gymnasium, and they, and uh, anyway, so this this guy from ACLU agreed to defend them, and when he came in to defend them, he filed a motion for discovery to find out what type of surveillance was being done against these people, uh, and he he filed he filed a, a civil rights lawsuit actually, to try to get this, filed a motion for discovery, and the U.S. attorney filed a motion to dismiss the case because they hadn't pleaded it correctly, uh, and the judge dismissed it. And uh, a week later or so, he's at the men's club or gymnasium or wherever he was, uh, uh, YMCA or something. Anyway, he's in the locker room after playing a bunch of basketball, and the, the assistant U.S. attorney comes in, uh, you know, and they're suiting up to go out and play some b-ball. And this young lawyer says to him, you know, uh, this thing, you know, that, uh, oh, the U.S. assistant attorney says to him, you know, look, at, I don't know hard feelings about that, you know, that, but you didn't plead the case right. And, uh, I, you know, I had to file the motion to dismiss it. And besides, there wasn't that much surveillance going on anyhow. And so the guy goes, really? Well, how much was there going on? The guy said, oh, not much at all. And so the, the young lawyer said, well, do you mind, you know, would you mind showing me at least, you know, what, what it is you had? And the guy says, sure, I don't, I don't mind doing that. Right? And so he goes over to the office the, a couple days later. This is a little town, New Hampshire. You know, they have to work with each other forever. And so he goes over there, and the guy starts showing him this stuff. And they've got, they've got this thing, Information Digest. Information Digest. Uh, and there's this thing, Larry McDonald, who's a, a right-wing Republican congressman from Georgia, is actually on the board of this thing called Information Digest. And this guy, John Reese, runs this thing. And, uh, and they've got information about different uh, nuclear, anti-nuclear groups that's in this information digest. And it keeps having these little bits that says, information provided by LEIU. And, and it keeps saying it over and over and over again. And so this guy, this lawyer guy, had called Sheila O'Donnell and asked her if she knew what LEIU was. And she didn't know what it was, but she remembered that he'd ask about this. So we then went and started getting copies of this thing, this information digest, and we found out that we did the investigation of it. And it turns out there's a thing called the Law Enforcement Intelligence Unit. And the Law Enforcement Intelligence Unit is a private, frater a private fraternity, which, in fact, uh, you can belong to in your purely private capacity only if, in your official capacity, you are a member of a a special intelligence unit from a major state police bureau of criminal investigation or a major city police department and you belong to it in your private capacity and what you do is if you want to have information political intelligence information uh, about a person a citizen what you do is you is you uh, you contact there's a thing they call a pointer index switching system which we track down to up in the northern peninsula of Michigan uh, it's, it's a, a big facility up there where they have a pointer switcher index system where you put in the information you want. This was the beginning of a computer system, actually, at that time. Uh, and what they would do is you'd ask for information about a particular person, uh, and then it would go into the switching system. They would send information out to a member of their organization. If anybody has information about this, what they do is they Xerox it and pack it up, and they send it by UPS. And they don't use any of the U.S. mails for this. They put it in a private UPS, and they UPS it to the other person in his private capacity at his private home. And so what we'd uncovered was a completely private uh, nationwide uh, political surveillance operation that was going on uh, with major police departments and state bureaus of criminal investigation in complete defiance of the major federal uh, civil rights rulings that had shut down the COINTELPRO operation for FBI which was the counterintelligence program where they were doing domestic political surveillance. So that's, that's how we found the wiretappers. We found out that, the, uh, that at this academy down in, uh, down in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood Airport, that uh, two of the people, Larry Upchurch 
in uh, in a uh, uh, in uh, Bill Love, uh, Bill uh, uh, or Harold Barons have been trained at this facility to do electronic surveillance for the Oklahoma City Police Department. And it turns out they had been hired by Jim Reading, the chief of security for Kerr McGee, to wiretap Karen Silkwood and to, and to, uh, to bug her home. And so that's how, that's how we got them. Uh, and we, we caught those people doing that. And I want to, uh, one more thing that, uh, that uh, Dick didn't quite get right. He indicated in the book that you wouldn't have seen it because it's way at the back. He said, oh, when it was all said and done, uh, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court uh, refused to review uh, Judge Tice's ruling dismissing the, the civil rights account. Well, let me tell you how it happened. It didn't happen that way at all. That it turns out that what happened, that, uh, that uh, I get a call one afternoon from Barbara Newman. Barbara Newman uh, was at the time working for, uh, for ABC 2020. She used to work for NPR Radio. She called me and said, Danny, uh, i got to get you on the phone with this guy, Andy, who works for me. He's just discovered something, and I want to know if it means anything to you. So I get on the phone with this guy, Andy, and he says, look, they just arrested two middle-level Kerr McGee officials trying to smuggle a very sensitive plutonium weighing scale across the border in Mexico down into some little nowhere dirt water town in Mexico. Uh, does that mean anything to you? I said, I don't know what the heck that means. I don't know, but I'll file it away and I'll, I'll, I'll just see if it means anything to us later. And it turns out about two weeks later, Jim Icard, who was our local counsel, ACLU guy, a local counsel in Oklahoma City working for us, with us on the case, he gets a call from a, uh, a reporter at the Daily Oklahoman newspaper in Oklahoma City. And the guy says, look, I need to have you come over and see me right now. So Jim Icard goes over to the guy's house, goes to the house, uh, walks up, knocks on the door, opens up the door. House is all completely empty. There's a big allied van line out front with all the guy's furniture all packed up in it. And there's two chairs sitting in the middle of his living room, uh, little wooden chairs. And so he goes in and sits down. He says, look, I've got to tell you this before I leave. He said, uh, I got a call about two weeks ago uh, from a man said that he wanted to meet me at this bar downtown. And I went to the bar downtown, and uh, the guy comes over and sits down next to me and starts telling me a story, that he is married to the woman who is the executive secretary of the president of the Kermagee uh, Nuclear Division. And uh, that, that he starts telling me this story, says the reporter. He said that his wife, one afternoon, was at the office, and she gets a call from the uh, Hanford uh, fast flux test facility in, in Hanford, Washington. This is one of the places that the Kerr McGee plant was sending these nuclear fuel rods. The, the gunners at the Kerr McGee plant was not a nuclear power plant. It was not generating nuclear power. What it was doing was reprocessing spent nuclear fuel. So in this, the spent nuclear fuel that has produced the waste material from the thing that there's the big problem, they don't know what to do with it. They were trying to develop a, a, a process by means of which they could take spent nuclear fuel, send it all to Oklahoma to this Kerr McGee nuclear facility, and what they would do is they would take it and they would grind it all up and put it in these centrifuges and they would spin it and spin off all the waste material and try to recover the unused plutonium that was still in the waste material. And then they would take this, this, this uh, plutonium and they would pack it into these little pellets, 98% pure bomb grade plutonium. And they'd put these pellets into these big long steel, stainless steel rods and then they would weld them closed at the top and then they would send them to the Hanford Fast Flux Test Facility. And what they were doing is trying to develop a technique at Hanford where they could use these fuel rods to fuel a nuclear power plant. And so that they would have solved the, the nuclear waste problem and been able to generate more fuel than they were actually using. So that was what this, that's why the Kerr McGee plant was so central to what it is they were doing. <clears throat> but anyway, she ends up getting a telephone call, says her husband, to this reporter, who is now telling this to Jim Icard. Uh, and the, the reporter says that the, the husband said that his wife, when she got this call, she, they said they wanted to talk to the president of the Kerr McGee Nuclear Division. And she said, well, he's not here right now, but could I take a message for him? And the guy, the president of the Hanford facility said, look, we just received a shipment of these fuel rods and we broke one open just to test them and they were missing two pellets. 
And so we opened up another one, and they were missing two pellets in that one too. And so we wanted to report that the, the shipment that we've been sent has an invoice that says each of them are supposed to have like 80 pellets, and they've only got 78 pellets in them. And so that we wanted to report that and complain about this because we're paying for these other ones, right? And so she ends up, she said, that, she said that when the president came back after lunch, she told him this, and the president says to her, oh, look, it, just go get those invoices and just change the number on the invoices. And she said, look, I can't do that. He said, well, bring it to me and I'll do it. So he, she brings in the documents and he just changes the numbers on the invoices, right? And she said another couple weeks went by and, uh, and it happened again. The, guy, the people from the next, in, the next shipment went out and they called and complained because there weren't enough in there. And she, calls, she tells her president of it again. And he says, look, I'll just go change them. And he goes to change them. She got so upset, she told her husband about this. And her husband thought it was so serious that he called this newspaper reporter and set up a meeting to tell him about it. So he tells him about it. The newspaper reporter goes back to his office and types up this story. A big whiz-bang story, you know, that Kerr McGee is defrauding the, the nuclear facility out at Hanford, giving them less pellets than they're supposed to, blah, 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 right? And he writes up the paper, the article, brings it to his editor, and the editor looks at it and he goes, uh-oh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think we can publish this without clearing it through the publisher of the paper. And so he takes, the editor takes the, the, the thing to the publisher, and the publisher looks at it and says, <coughs> uh-oh, I don't think we can publish this. Uh, I'm going to have to clear this with Dean McGee of, of Kerr McGee. That I happen to sit on the board of directors of the bank in town with him. How do you like that for an image? That uh, We both sit as members of the bank board in town, and so I'll bring it to the meeting of the bank directors, and I'll show him this and ask him to tell me what's going on. <clears throat> so he brings the article to the, to the meeting of the bank, bank board and shows the Dean McGee, Dean McGee says, oh, hold it a second, hold it a second. Uh, don't go anywhere with this. Let me check out what's going on here. He said, so a week later, Dean McGee calls back the, the uh, publisher of the newspaper. And he says, oh, he said, no, no, we figured out what this is. It was just a mistake. And so the publisher at least has the presence of mind to say, oh, really, what happened? And I said, oh, those extra pellets, uh, they were misshipped somewhere else. And the guy says, really? He says, Where? You know, wasn't saying, you know, they're inside welded you know, steel tubes, you know. They don't just get misshipped somewhere. And he said, well, but where, where, where'd they get misshipped? He said, oh, see, they found them down in a little airport hangar down in San Diego, California, on their way to some little nowhere dirt water town in Mexico, he says to the publisher. Okay. So the publisher comes back and tells the editor that they've killed the story, to kill the story, that they found him. He tells the story to the to the to the publisher. The publisher goes and tells the journalist, and the journalist gets really angry and resigns, you know, in protest over them killing this story. So he's sitting there now getting ready to leave, and he tells Jim Icard this. So Jim Icard comes back, and he tells me the story, right? He tells me exactly. So I put two and two together, and I'm going, wait a second. Kerr McGee mid-level officials caught smuggling a sensitive plutonium weighing scale across the border of Mexico into a no little, nowhere dirt little town, and now they got the, the, these pellets going over there. And so I call Billy Taylor. Billy Taylor and I fly back to Washington, D.C., and we go into Pete Stockton's office, right, in the, con in the, in the Congress. So we walk, we walk into Pete Stockton's. I start to tell him the story. He says, hold it, not here. He says, look, and he writes out in a, a little paper, come to my home tonight you know, at 12 o'clock tonight. So he gives us the address. Billy and I go to his house out in Chevy Chase, right? We go to his house, and we go all the way upstairs into his house at midnight, upstairs in the attic. He's got this big soundproof room up there, you know, with these plunger doors and the big, you know, walls with the little holes in them and stuff like that. And so we go in, and we sit down in this little soundproof room, and we lay out to him what we've got about this information. And he goes... Wow, he says, this is, this is really uh, dangerous stuff. This is dangerous stuff. I'm going to bring it to Dingle tomorrow, and we'll see what we can find out. So he brings it to Dingle the next day, and Dingle sends a memo over to Stansfield Turner, who's the, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, right? A uh, you know, handwritten note with, with, from John Dingle, the chairman of the House Subcommittee on Energy and the Environment, saying, we've got indications here that there may be a smuggling of bomb-grade plutonium going on out of a nuclear facility here. Since he waits a day and nothing happens. He waits two days and nothing happens. So Stockton calls and he says, look, uh, same place, same time, tonight. 
So Billy and I go back over. We go to his house at midnight. We go upstairs. You know, he's got like 12 kids running around the house. We, we go upstairs, and we, we go up into this little soundproof room, and he says, we need to have more. I said, what do you mean you need to have more? What the hell are you guys doing? You know, you're, you're the government. You know, here we are. We're just a private group. We're trying to, he says, I'm telling you, we need to have more. So we go back down, and Billy Taylor goes and calls up Alpha. And he says, look, uh, here's what we've got. And he lays out the whole thing. And Alpha calls him back uh, in about two hours, and he says, Israel, Iran, South Africa, and Brazil, he says. <laughs> and Billy says, what about them? The guy says, that's all I'm telling you. <laughs> and so we call, we, call, we call Stockton, right? We go back to Stockton's house that night. And up we go into his room, and we tell him this. And he goes, holy shit, he says. And he says, I'm going to tell Dingle. So he goes back the next morning and tells Dingle. Dingle takes a copy of his letter, his handwritten letter, and he handwrites on it, Israel, South, Israel Iran, South Africa, and Brazil, and has it hand-delivered over to Stan Turner, right? You know, one hour later, Stansfield Turner is standing in front of his, front of his desk, in the Congress going, uh, uh, John, John, you know, you and, I, uh, you and I need to talk about this. You and I need to talk about this. At which point John Dingle says, fuck you. <laughs> he says, fuck you. He said, you and I had a chance to talk privately. I sent you the memo, and you just pissed me right off. He said, so you're going to get a chance to go down and talk under oath to our entire committee in closed doors down in the secure room downstairs here in the Congress right now. And so, so, uh, so the uh, CIA, CIA director uh, uh, goes, all right, all right, I'll go down there. So he goes downstairs with John Dingle, and they get, they get into this big closed room, and Stansfield Turner is there testifying under it. So, well, you know, he said, uh, in fact, uh, we, had heard, we had heard rumors uh, about this thing possibly going on, but uh, we did an official CIA rumor evaluation report. Uh, and we have disproved that this is going on. And uh, unfortunately, it's a very highly classified uh, document, and you don't have the clearances, really, to uh, have all that. But I've tried to get them to at least give you uh, a copy, even though there's a bunch of parts whited out. Uh, and hopefully they'll come here while we're still having this, this meeting, and bang, bang on the door, right? Comes one of the people from over at the agency at Langley. And they come to the door, and he goes, oh, here it is right now. And he gets the thing, and he brings it out, and he hands it out to all the people on the committee, and they'd white it out all the wrong parts. <laughs> and he was screwed. And there it was, a, a rumor evaluation report, acknowledging that they knew that they were smuggling this stuff, right? And, and the, the CIA hadn't told anybody about it. And so John Dingle gets so angry that he gets a hold of a friend of his at NSA, and they assign a real-time satellite to put on spot guard over the Kerr-McGee facility and over their sister plant called NUMEC, which is up in New Hampshire, right? It has, uh, has U-238, highly enriched U-238 uranium being handled up there, and they track them. And what they do is they track them smuggling enriched U-238 uranium out of the NUMEC facility out onto a charter oil company uh, uh, ship, right? And, they, and what they do is they, what they've done is they've brought it all the way down from there. They smuggled it all the way down to the Mexican border, sent it across the border, put it on the, the charter oil uh, company thing, goes out into the Pacific, and they're tracking it with a real-time NSA satellite. And they've got them, and they show them being boarded by Mossad out in the, out in the Pacific Ocean and loading all the stuff onto the Mossad uh, boat. And that they catch them just like that. Okay? And so Dingle, so, so, so Pete Stockton tells us about this, right? And so we write the whole thing up in an, we write the whole thing up in an affidavit, and I submit it to Judge Tice, who's the new judge. And Judge Tice, I've just got to finish this thing by they're getting death signals here, but the, 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 but the, so Jack Tice had, was the third judge on this case that we'd gotten two of them taken off by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals because it was a bloodbath and they were fighting me and wouldn't give me the discovery and so so we got them thrown out and so so that finally Jack Tice comes in uh, Judge Tice 
And in the first hearing, he comes, he comes in, he comes in out of uh, Kansas. He was a chief federal judge in Kansas. And he comes in, and he's up on the bench, and uh, we're all sitting there. And we've been taking a beating from these two judges. Wouldn't give us any discovery. I told you, wouldn't sign any of the motions to compel. And so finally, he comes in, he's, he gets up on the bench, and Glenn Whitaker, who is the attorney for the FBI defendants in the case, stands up and he says, oh, welcome, welcome, Judge Tice. It's really nice to have you here have you here in the state of Oklahoma? And Judge, Judge Tice looks over at him, he pulls his glasses down, and he says, Mr. Whitaker, is it? He says, Mr. Whitaker, sit down and be quiet. He said, he said, I've been asked by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals to come in to sit on this case because the way this case has been conducted up to this point in time raises fundamental questions about the basic fairness of the entire American judicial system. He said, and I'm here, and I'm going to order you people to turn over to these young lawyers what they've been asking here for for a year, and you're going to turn this information over to them. And he said, and we are either, he said, we're, you're going to give them what they're looking for, and we are either going to lay to rest, the, the, we're going to lay this young Karen Silkwood to rest right now, or she's going to get up and walk in this courtroom. That's what he said to him. And so he ordered them to cough up all that stuff. And he gave us, for the first time, we've been trying to subpoena them to give us some of the materials they'd taken out of her house so we could run an isotopic test on the radioactivity so we could get the signature of it and then compare it to the different, uh, different lot numbers that were in the facility to find out where this thing came from. And we found out from that that it was in lot number 29, which had never been in the plant at any time that she'd ever been there. And the only sample of it that they had was under lock and key in the possession of the Kerr-McGee management in a completely different facility. And they were dead in the water at that point until, until we submitted the affidavits to Judge Tice about what we found out about the plutonium smuggling. And we gave him the affidavits, and uh, he called me on the phone two days later and said, and this, we're still in discovery, right, before the trial. And he says, Mr. Sheehan, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I've been contacted by the Central Intelligence Agency, and they want me to go into a closed-door, in-camera, ex parte meeting with them, their lawyers from CIA, and they didn't want me to tell anybody about this, but I feel duty-bound to tell you, I want you to come to the courthouse tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, and I'm not going to have you come into the, to the meeting, but I want you in the courtroom so that you can be on the record that you know this, and so I said, I object completely to being excluded from this. He said, I would assume you do. So I come to the courtroom the next morning, and he's sitting up on the, the bench, and in comes Glenn Whitaker, the FBI lawyer, with these two suits from CIA. And they come walking in, and, and Judge Tice says, Mr. Sheehan, I just wanted on the record that you're here, and I'm going to be meeting with Mr. Whitaker and these two people whom I assume are from the CIA. He said, and I'm going to go into the chambers. He said, I'm noting your objection on the record, but I want you to wait here, and I'll be out in a few minutes. So he goes in. And two minutes later, uh, Cy Hirsch comes through the door. Cy Hirsch from the New York Times, one of the major uh, investigative reporters from the New York Times, comes into the, into, the, into the room and he sits down with me. He says, Danny, what's going on? What's going on? So I told him what was going on. He said, never. They're never going to let you have that. They're never going to let you have that. Are you talking, are you, you're talking about the smuggling. You found out the source of the, the weapons-grade material going to Israel. They're never going to let you have that. He said, and it's, it's going to be just like the Kennedy assassination. That's what he said to me. It's going to be just like the Kennedy assassination. He said, I know you know about that because I've been told. And so we sit there, and a couple of minutes later, out comes Judge Tice, and he gets up on the bench, and he says, well, Mr. Sheehan, this is a quote on the record. Well, Mr. Sheehan, you can be certain that it's sinister. He said, but it's also most definitely secret. He said, this is just a glass mountain that you're not going to be allowed to climb in this case. And I'm hereby taking judicial notice of the fact that you have filed this, this account under the Federal Civil Rights Act. It was passed in 1871, immediately following the end of the, the Civil War. And I'm taking judicial notice of the fact that the Civil War was fought solely and exclusively for the purpose of freeing the black race from slavery. And therefore, I'm interpreting this statute as applying only to the black members of the black race. And since Karen Silkwood never even made a, never asserted anywhere within the four corners of her complaint that she was a member of the Negro race, uh, that I'm going to have to dismiss your account. And he said, uh, he said, no, look, I, I know you don't agree with this, and I note your objection to it. And he said, and, uh, and if, in fact, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals reverses me on this, 
then we'll include this count back in on the, in the case and we'll try it along with the contamination count. But as of now, I'm dismissing it and I will sign for you an emergency request asking them to rule on this immediately. He said, but, if, but until that time, we're going to go to trial next week, he said, on, the, on this other count. And I want you guys to prepare to go to trial and I want it be, to be very clear, he said, that you're going to find this court to be very, very liberal in its rulings on your behalf on this other count in light of this decision I've made here today. But I want you ready for trial in, uh, in, in a week. And uh, that's what happened to the count one, uh, count two. And it took the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals 18 months to reverse him. But they did. They reversed him and said that he was in error. And, uh, and they said, but the fact of the matter is that because you've already won the trial, we'd already won the trial on the count, the count one, we won $10.5 million. And so the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals said, even though he was in error, we reverse him, but it's completely moot because you already won $10.5 million out of your $11 million. And therefore, therefore uh, we don't need to try that count. So that's, that's what happened to count two uh, in the case. And uh, so we'll, we'll pick up on the trial, which is going to start. We'll pick up on the trial Tuesday, and we'll uh, tell you what happened there. Okay? Thank you, guys.